No one should live in fear of the person they love. Yet far too many do. One in four women and one in seven men will experience domestic violence by a partner sometime in their life. This number is just a conservative estimate. It doesn't include unreported encounters, and it doesn't include verbal or psychological abuse, which is often just as damaging. Even so, given this conservative statistic, that means that roughly 20 of you sitting in here today have or will experience domestic violence. If you had told me years ago that I would experience domestic violence and that I was going to stay with a man who abused me, I wouldn't have believed you. Those things don't happen to people like me. I'm educated, independent, strong. Even if I were to experience domestic violence, I certainly wouldn't stay. I would be the second anyone lay their hands on me. This is a huge misconception. I didn't understand how abuse worked, and most don't until it happens to them. Among many things, I learned that abuse does not discriminate. It can happen to anyone, and it can trap anyone, and I was no exception to this. My name is Hannah Petrillo. I'm a domestic violence survivor, and I'm here with you today to share parts of my story and to help you better understand the complexities of abuse. So how did I go from believing that I would never put up with abuse to staying in a relationship that could kill me? The boiling frog analogy, something my counselor shared with me, helped me to better understand this. The premise of the analogy is that if a frog is put into boiling water, it will jump out. But if it is put in cold water and brought to a boil slowly, it will not perceive the danger and be cooked to death. People in domestic violence situations are not thrown into a pot of boiling water. Rather, it is a slow and strategic cooking process facilitated by the abuser to gain control. While I was in the midst of an abusive relationship, I could never accept that I was that frog being slowly cooked. Looking back now, though, it is so clear to me. What began as a fairy tale relationship with promises of a beautiful future slowly morphed into controlling behaviors disguised as him looking out for my well being. This turned into telling me who I could be friends with, what I could wear. This turned into verbal rage and throwing items at me, which turned into shoving hair pulling, and then hitting. The heat continued to turn up. He would choke me, rape me, and threaten to kill me and my family. When I got out of the hospital after the first big incident, I began to see a domestic violence counselor, and she asked me to set boundaries. She said, where do you draw the line and walk away? I told her, choking, that's my line. Just two months later, Israel choked me, and I stayed. Israel, by the way, is the name of my ex-boyfriend. Now, I knew choking wasn't okay. I knew none of it was okay. But I adjusted to it and found myself justifying what I had considered inexcusable behavior. If a friend were to tell me that their significant other choked them, I would tell them to run from that relationship. So how could I not take the same advice? It is not because I am weak, or that I don't value myself, or that I am stupid. Members of our community need to strip away these harmful assumptions. They are false, and they bring shame to victims who are already being torn apart by the person they love. I am strong, I am worthy, and I am smart. And so are all the other men and women who decide to stay with their abusive partners. The reason someone stays is no fault of their own. The abuser uses power, control, and a great deal of manipulation to trap their victim into submission. This wheel shows eight of the common tactics used to do so. Israel used several of these on me. He isolated me from friends, tried to isolate me from family. He used intimidation and violence by throwing items at me, destroying my property. He used his status as the man of the house to tell me that as a woman, it was my job to give him any sexual favor on demand. 
One early morning, when I didn't want to have sex for the fourth time in a row, because it hurt. He kicked me out of the bed and pushed me out of his house into the street. But he would minimize the abuse and often blamed it on me. Really, whenever he could, he would flip the situation. Tell me how terrible of a girlfriend I was, making me feel like I was the one who needed to apologize. He would follow this up by threatening to leave me. And although this sounds like a great opportunity for me to get out easy, that's not how I took it. I feared losing him. And this fear is a common theme in many abusive relationships. It stems from trauma bonding. When someone that we love traumatizes us, the neurochemicals in our brain become significantly dysregulated, causing us to crave that person and to do all that we can to make things right with them. Israel knew that threatening to leave was a sure way to get control and obedience from me. In fact, the first time he was physical with me, he broke up with me. Because how dare I like a guy's Instagram photo? When I got out of the hospital, he found me and begged for forgiveness. I took him back. But you know what I was sure to never do again? Like a guy's Instagram photo, along with anything else that he didn't want me doing. Because not only did that mean he would hurt me, that would mean I would lose him. And that is the worst thing I could imagine. This trauma bond, along with what I interpreted to be intense feelings of love, and the belief that things would get better is a big reason I stayed. But everyone's reason for staying and their feelings of entrapment vary. Other common reasons include relying on your partner for finances, religious or cultural beliefs, not having a support system, the fear that no one will believe you, or being afraid of what your partner has threatened to do if you leave. You may be thinking, but how could anyone fall in love with someone like this to begin with? The answer is we don't. We don't fall in love with someone who presents themselves as controlling and violent. Abusers are master manipulators at gaining a person's love and trust. They lure you in with nothing but acts of love and kindness. This is known as love bombing. Israel love bombed the shit out of me. Before we even began dating, I woke up one day to a vase of hand-picked flowers on my front porch. He brought me on romantic getaways. He wanted to know everything about me, and he praised every little thing. When we began to date, he talked about the extravagant future we were going to have together. We were going to live in a tropical paradise and sail the world. And at the time, that was my dream. He knew that and he knew everything else I liked. And with that, he painted the most perfect future I could imagine. I fell in love with Israel before he began to abuse me. It wasn't until I was wrapped around his fingers that the heat began to really turn up. And when the abuse did begin, it wasn't constant. There's a cyclical pattern to domestic violence. After an incident, Israel would reconcile with me. He would apologize and assure me things would be better. He used this time to remind me about his trust issues, about his terrible ex-girlfriends, and that he just needed time to see that I for sure wasn't like them. He convinced me we were soulmates. And how could I give up on my soulmate? So I stayed. And then for some time, things would go on as they had in the beginning, with the exception that I now had rules to follow. Rules that I believe were only temporary until things did get better. And so during this time, he would treat me like his princess. This is known as the honeymoon period. Eventually though, no matter what I did to please him, tensions would rise and something would set him off and the cycle would continue to repeat. Living through this cycle is how trauma bonds are deepened. You crave your partner's love and kindness, and you hold on to the hope that the bad things will come to an end. So how did I escape the cycle? It is when I accepted that the bad things were not coming to an end. 
and that the good things were just a show. For so long, I denied this because I didn't want to believe it. It is only when I found out he had been unfaithful multiple times that I was able to see and accept things for what they really were. He was a manipulative, narcissistic sociopath, and he was not going to change. He would get mad at me for sitting next to a male in the classroom and constantly accuse me of cheating. Yet he was the one sleeping around with other women and lying about it. Everything he accused me of was a projection of his actions. Accepting this broke my heart because it meant losing who I thought he was. And I had given up so much of myself and my freedom because I believed in him. More than anything, I wanted to see Israel through the dark times so that the future that once seemed so promising would come to life. Though it was very painful to accept the reality of my situation and let go of the illusion he created, I am beyond grateful that I did because I now see how dangerously deep I was in that relationship. I would like to say that I would have left if he tried to kill me, and I believe I would have. But just as I excused the choking, I may have excused a near-death beating. I want to share with you some things that I wish I had known before meeting Israel. In order to protect yourself from falling in love with someone like this, it is important to know the early warning signs and to accept what they signify before the water starts to heat up. Because once it heats up, that psychological hold and the power they have over you make it much more difficult to leave. So here are some of these signs. Love bombing and a fast-paced relationship are typical signs at the beginning of an abusive relationship. However, they are not definite indicators of abuse. So listen to yourself. If things don't feel right, they probably aren't. I remember my dad expressing to me, don't you think it's scary? Israel seems too good to be true. What is he hiding? Now imagine if I had listened to my dad's gut feelings. Signs that are more subtle include having rigid gender roles, showing signs of possessiveness, always deflecting blame, and isolating you from loved ones. If your partner shows traces of these, know that it is not healthy, not to be excused, and will likely only progress. If your partner speaks disrespectfully about multiple exes and doesn't acknowledge their own role in whatever went wrong, this is a red flag. It is likely that they are the problem, not their exes. Israel told me that every single one of his exes was a lying, deceitful bitch Come to find out, they were none of those. And he had abused every single one of them. Finally, if you find out that your partner has a past of domestic violence, you need to take this very seriously. When Israel's current girlfriend found out about his past as a result of him going to jail and being charged with domestic violence, she came to his defense and said, he would never hurt anyone. You might think, how stupid could she be? But I get it. I've been where she is. All she's experienced is his ultra-loving side. And he is great at twisting stories. If she knew these signs and was educated on abuse, she would have a much better shot at leaving before things start to heat up. And that goes for everyone. There is so much more to domestic violence than what I've shared with you today. So if you want to know more, how to spot the signs, how to support someone going through it, what to do if you are going through it, I encourage you to go to thehotline.org or call their number. Now, after leaving an abusive situation, there is a road of healing ahead. It hasn't even been a year since I left the abuse. Yet here I am. I certainly still carry scars and have remnants of PTSD. But given the circumstances, I'm doing much more okay, much sooner than I would have expected. 
I believe that counseling is a very important step to healing. But what I found to be even more transformative in my recovery is sharing my story. I first shared last September for an assignment in one of my university courses. The assignment was to share a personal suffering in an expressive arts performance. I performed a monologue accompanied by a dance piece that captured the life of my abusive relationship from beginning to end. Sharing my story in this way helped me to reclaim my voice and my power. I received so much love and support from everyone who witnessed it, and this gave me the courage to be even more open. By doing so, I have let others know that they are not alone, and have encouraged them to distance themselves from toxic people in their own lives. I had no idea that sharing my story could have such an impact. But the thing is, my story is not unique. There are millions of people who have been through abuse and who are going through it right now, including some of you in this room. So why the silence? Abuse adversely impacts so many in our community, yet we shy away from talking about it because it's an uncomfortable topic. But this only fuels the problem. Abuse happens behind closed doors, and it thrives in secrecy. So we must speak up. I want all of you to join me in adding voices to the fight against abuse. If you can, share your story. Educate yourself. Learn how to support someone going through it and teach your children what a healthy relationship looks like. Because the more voices that are heard, and the more educated we are, the more we can take a stand against this. Thank you.